It is a truth universally acknowledged that Pride and Prejudice is one of the most well-known, revered novels of all time. Whether you had to read it for school, hate read it for fun, or are one of the many fans, like me, who fell for the story of Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy and who can't get enough of Jane Austen, there's a chance you have some opinions about this book. Thousands of research papers, blog posts, and videos have been published on themes characters, and nuanced historical details surrounding this one work alone. Whether you love it or you hate it, and fun fact, Mark Twain was a famous hater of Jane Austen. <laughs> This video will cover some of the scientific details you might have missed. Yes, there is science in Pride and Prejudice if you look closely. No, not just the zombie stuff from the 2009 bestseller Pride and Prejudice and Zombies, <laughs> but some very specific details in the book, including some very important plot points. And yes, there will be spoilers. Sorry, Pride and Prejudice was published in 1813, so it's been out for a while. Very quickly, Pride and Prejudice tells the story of the Bennett sisters, a middle-class family in early 19th century England, and yes, it is fiction, how the daughters and family members navigate marriage, love, and societal obligations, and especially our main protagonist, Elizabeth Bennett. Now, if you're thinking, <sighs> so boring, why do I want to read about this? Well, it is one of the most famous love stories of all time. Now, there's a million reasons to love or hate this novel, and there's a lot that happens more than just a love story. If you pay attention to the details, there are some things that really stay true to modern society and feelings and romance, but we're here to talk about the science. So let's get back to one of the most important scenes in the very beginning of the novel. The mom of all these daughters, Mrs. Bennet, is an interesting character and also a bit of a gold digger. She wants to hook her daughters up with some rich gentlemen who have come to town, Mr. Bingley and Mr. Darcy. When the oldest daughter, Jane, receives an invitation to come have dinner with Bingley's sister, Bingley, and Mr. Darcy, the mom realizes that it's about to rain, so she intentionally does not send her daughter off in a carriage and instead puts her on a horse, hoping that she'll have to stay the night or at least a longer period of time at this place with the rich guys. The next morning, after riding in the rain and having to stay overnight, night at Netherfield Hall, Jane is sick and has to stay there even longer, which Mrs. Bennet is very happy about. This brings the next sister, Elizabeth, coming to her aid, and she walks several miles to get to Netherfield Hall to be able to spend time and take care of her sister. So let's take a look a little bit at the specific case. The very next morning, Jane writes to her family, I find myself very unwell this morning, which I suppose is to be imputed to my getting wet through yesterday. She goes on to say, accepting a sore throat and a headache, there is not much the matter with me. The mom isn't concerned. She thinks her daughter has a cold. She says she's not gonna die and it'll help her spend more time with these rich guys. We find out later that she gets very feverish. So she has a fever and she's not well enough to leave her room. They call in the apothecary, which is kind of like a pharmacist. He prescribes some medicine. After taking the meds, her feverish symptoms increase and she has a really bad headache. So what we know of Jane's signs and symptoms, she probably does have a cold, probably a rhinovirus. So colds are caused by viruses. But this part of the novel always bugs me because it propagates the myth, a very common myth in Jane Austen's time, but still held today, that you can get sick by being out in the cold or being out in the rain. Now, it is true that we see more colds and flus in colder months of the year, but that's not due to the cold air itself or a colder climate. In fact, it's more because people are staying indoors and they're having to be closer together during these times, which allows these viruses to be transmitted all the easier. These viruses also function better at lower temperatures. So even though we see a correlation between cold weather and more cold populations, it doesn't mean that cold weather is actually causing those colds. Rain as well. Rain cannot cause you to catch a cold. Getting wet cannot cause you to catch a cold. Now, you can be more susceptible to colds if you're extremely tired or you're stressed out, which puts more stresses on your immune system. And if there's more rain, you might be more likely to stay indoors, again, be closer to people and have that increased chance of getting an infection. And of course, like I said before, these viruses do live a little bit longer, do better in colder temperatures and low humidity. But here's the kicker. Most colds have an incubation period, meaning between when you get infected by that virus and when you start to show symptoms of around 24 to 72 hours. So even at the very fastest turnaround, Jane leaves in that afternoon to go dine with the guys, but then finds herself very sick the next morning. That's a really short time period to actually catch a cold from the rain and then show symptoms. Again, she didn't catch the cold from the rain. She most definitely already was infected with her cold before she went out to meet the guys. Whatever she got, she probably got it from her sisters or her mother or whatever. And when her sister, Elizabeth, our main character in Pride and Prejudice, goes to take care of her, it's really unlikely that she wouldn't have caught it too. But Elizabeth gets off scot-free and doesn't have any cold symptoms. 
Now, I'm not saying this scene in Pride and Prejudice is terrible and it's all wrong, but I want to make sure when people are reading it, they're thinking that maybe Jane's infection didn't necessarily come from the rain and Jane's mother, Mrs. Bennet, just got lucky. She's not the evil matchmaking mastermind that people make her out to be. Now, this does lead to some very important plot points in that Mr. Darcy, our male protagonist, gets to spend some more time with Elizabeth after she walks a long ways. He takes notice of the brilliancy which exercise had given to her complexion and the time they spend together at Netherfield increases his admiration for her. He gets to see some of her wittiness. Elizabeth gets a chance to get in some really good zingers and go against some of Darcy's perceptions, especially about the skills and qualities that an accomplished woman should possess. So even though the rain is used as a very important plot device in this part of the novel, it probably was a lucky coincidence that Jane caught cold. So in a later part of the novel, a lot of the daughters in the Bennett family are very sad because a bunch of soldiers that have been stationed near their town are leaving. The girls are exclaiming how sad and bitter they are. Their mother, Mrs. Bennett, once again says, oh, if one could go to Brighton, a little sea bathing would set me up forever. So where is Brighton and what in the world is sea bathing? Well, this is an activity, a leisure activity, that is a common occurrence in Jane Austen's writing and in her novels. It's known that Jane Austen herself enjoyed sea bathing. Sea bathing stems from the common and belief that sea air and sea water did really good things for your health. But for young women of the time, it's not as simple as just a dip in the ocean. What you'd have to do in order to go sea bathing, you'd have to get into a bathing machine, and which is kind of like a little cabana on wheels. Then this little box is dragged into the sea, and then you can get out of it and get into the water without anybody having to see you or your swimming attire. Sometimes there'd be another female attendant, a dipper, there to help you. But it allowed women to swim in the ocean without any concerns about modesty, so this is just one of the many activities that would take place in a town like Brighton and why it's so fun and leisurely. And Elizabeth Bennet, again, our protagonist in this book, expresses concern about letting her sister go there later on in the novel, but she goes anyway, and it leads to her eventual elopement with Wickham. But even though women were very modest about their bathing habits in this time, men were still documented as going nude to bathe. That famous scene with Colin Firth in the Pride and Prejudice BBC miniseries could have been done without any clothes at all. Now, there are still some papers in parts of the world where research is being published on deep seawater as a type of alternative medicine, and there are many beliefs that seawater or ocean going is actually good for your health. But scientifically, it's not really considered anymore to be a cure for disease or an actual improvement to your health. There are still some people who believe and talk about the properties of seawater and how they can cure diseases or certain conditions, and there's still certain products that contain things like dead sea salt, which is supposed to help a certain skin condition. But there's been studies to show that the Dead Sea bathing or going to the Dead Sea, it's actually just as beneficial to be out there in the sun of the Dead Sea. The water can help reflect the rays of the sun so you can get the sunlight benefits as well. But something going specifically to go bathe in Dead Sea water is gonna see the most benefits from the sunlight itself. Now, are there any real health benefits to bathing in the ocean or going sea bathing like they did in Jane Austen's time? The real health benefits are related to decreased stress levels in a calming environment. And also maybe there are breathing patterns that you might have while you're swimming and going underwater. Slower breathing that you might use during swimming is related to improvements in overall respiration. It can lower your heart rate, make you feel more relaxed, but we don't know of any actual true scientific benefits of being at the beach and swimming in the ocean. In fact, research published in 2019 said that bathing in the ocean can actually have negative impacts on your skin microbiome. When you swim in the ocean, there are ocean bacteria that will go on your skin. And the ocean water can also wash off your normal healthy bacteria that's part of your own microbiome that's on your skin. And some of that ocean bacteria, especially if you're in an area where there's pollution levels or wastewater runoff, can actually cause infection on your skin and on your body. So if you're someone who believes going to the beach or swimming in the ocean is a cure-all, you might wanna check your science. All right, so why all this wedding and marriage stuff? Well, a lot of people say that the main characters in Pride and Prejudice are so concerned with getting married because it is the early 1800s and they're young women and that's basically on the top of their priorities. Well, looking at statistical data, we can see that life expectancy for women in the United Kingdom in that time was around 40 years old. Jane Austen herself died when she was 41. Historians and scientists still debate what actually caused her death. Some have suspected Addison's disease and Hodgkin's lymphoma based on her symptoms and some of the things that she wrote to her family during that time. There was a hypothesis published that she had arsenic poisoning at one time, but that 
theory has been widely debunked and is very unlikely. If we look at our main characters, our two oldest Bennett sisters, Jane and Elizabeth, are 22 and 20. Average age of getting married around that time was 22, but the law required you to have permission from your parents if you wanted to get married before 21, which is why Lydia in the book is going to go to Scotland to elope with Wickham. But overall throughout the book, if you're just reading it at a surface level, you're not picking up on the satirical details that Jane Austen is talking about, where she shows how skeptical she is about the institution of marriage and getting married as a business venture. There are some cognitive psychologists and evolutionary psychologists who have looked at the change around that time looking to marriage for love reasons instead of looking to marriage simply as a transactional agreement or societal obligation. I'm not going to get too much into the psychology part of things in this video, but feel free to check out some of the links I have below if you're interested in that. One of the more interesting things that's mentioned briefly in the book is when Elizabeth goes to the area that Darcy lives in when she's starting to realize her feelings for him and feels a little bit embarrassed about going to that area. But surely, said she, I may enter his county with impunity and rob it of a few petrified spars without his perceiving me. This statement in her head is kind of a joke, but what is a petrified spar? A petrified spar is a particular specimen of fossilized wood, but not true petrification as some biologists would call it. There were famous petrifying wells around around this area of England. This one we think was the Matlock Bath. This is a type of well or body of water where if you place an object in it, it's gonna gather a stony appearance after some time, many years perhaps. What was popular at the time was going into these wells and placing objects like hats, wood, other things, and watching them turn to stone and then taking them as souvenirs. The surrounding towns would even sell them as souvenirs. In real petrification, the original molecules of the object are replaced entirely with other materials, like stone or minerals. In these petrifying wells, you place a particular object under the water and layers of minerals like calcium carbonate are gradually gonna build up around the object until it makes something of stone. Again, it was really just a fun thing for tourists and visitors to do where they could go and get objects that had been petrified in these dripping wells. So when Elizabeth's talking about robbing some petrified spars from Darcy's County, she's joking, but she's also referring to the ridiculous influence he's starting to have over her and that she's thinking about him so much, even when she's not seeing him directly, but being in the space in the surrounding area. Now, there have been other people who have attempted to dig into the science of Pride and Prejudice. One was a mathematical model of Pride and Prejudice, where the mathematicians talked about catastrophic bifurcations in romantic relationships and created a whole model through ordinary differential equations. I have to admit, I didn't understand most of it, but I'll link it in the description below if you're curious. And of course, Pride and Prejudice has inspired many of the scientists, including researchers at the University of Liverpool, who in 2010 named a pheromone that attracts female mice to the odor of a specific male, the Darcin protein found in male mouse urine. In an experiment, once the female mice had smelled the, this particular protein in the male mouse urine, they spent double the amount of time near that male mouse. If they touched the Darcin protein with their noses, then they would triple the amount of time spent with that particular mouse, but not with other males. This is interesting because it's a specific protein that's driving sexual attraction in vertebrates. And there's a lot more still to learn about pheromones in other vertebrates as well. Now, I hope you got to learn something today while I dove into the details of Pride and Prejudice to try to pull out some really interesting scientific case studies from the novel. If you have other books that you want me to dissect or talk about the science of, please let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like, give it a subscribe if you want to see more content from me. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you later.